And it's only a test. Uh, Can I record your voice explanations and put them on? <laughs> yeah, let me. Um, oh, why? Okay, that's right. I need to do. I'm not getting off. Someone has played with things. Uh -oh. and uh -oh. Turned off. Janet. No, no, it's, it's I didn't the, go past the table. It's the op who was here on Sunday or during the week early. So, okay. So, but this um, this light is also duplicated up on the bridge, and uh, so this is an error if it uh, you know if they're static or something and it runs past the. Uh, the four seconds, then and this lights up and indicates on the bridge. So I set this, there's a little buzzer which actually makes some RF, and there's sort of a calibrated amount from a little probe by the antenna wire. And so you uh, you set the gain of this to that. Okay, so I will now send, uh, simulate sending the attention signal. So, in four second dash, one second space, and there's a timing device which I'll show you that is timing the dashes and spaces and counting up in a relay memory, very crude. And uh, when it gets to four good ones in a row, Console, <laughs> the operator's <laughs> cabin, and up on the bridge. And so, you know, we're on a, on a ship like this. There'd just be one radio operator, and they'd work a normally a, a split shift uh, mm -hmm. during the day, morning, noon, and evening. So, you know, very simple TRF receiver, um, uh, which then produces uh, relay closure. Uh, when it hears something, and an interesting but still kind of um, crude uh, mechanism. So this is a governed motor, uh, and so this is running uh, like one revolution every uh, ten seconds, I think. So, and it's kind of clever, but there are some magnetic clutches here. So, for example. When it gets a signal, it pulls in. The first switch is three and a half seconds. The next one is four and a half. And it's, if it's between that, then it's a good dash and goes into memory. And then this one times the space. And then this cam here, by operating this switch, this will actually key the transmitter so that you can send this signal without having to do it manually. So you can write up your distress message while the attention signal is going out. And, uh, do they still use that attention signal? It sounded, it, it just kind of reminded me when they flash something on TV or the radio, uh, did they go, duh, yeah, duh, you're right. duh, and it's, yes. you know, it's a thunder alert or something? Right, Is that, the same that's, thing? that's actually thing? a digital signal. But right. the same same idea though, well, it sounds kind of the same. It sounds kind of the same, but it's a digital signal which actually is saying what it is oh. and what oh. area it covers. Oh, so if you have the right receiver, you can uh, tell. That's right. So ah, and it's okay. mainly for broadcast stations or if you have a home. Yeah, you hear it on the radio and um, such. They'll break in and tell you to warn right. you something. It's referred to in the industry as duck farts. <laughs> <laughs> the, the digital noises. But then there's a tone after mm -hmm. that to, you know, to, because some... It, that is, if you had a receiver that didn't unmute, then you wouldn't hear those until, and, and if you had your receiver set for like a certain county or a certain mm -hmm. area and a certain type of okay. event, then if all that matched, then it would unmute your receiver. You're, you're one of the ladies, huh? Yeah. Okay. okay. So, so uh, but anyway, this was a very important <laughs> piece of technology and, uh, um, the operator had to uh, 
keep that working because that was, I mean, the main purpose of the ship was safety mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. this ship and every other ship. Um, and even, you know, shore station operators, we've talked to uh, some people who worked at KPH back in the day. And, you know, they said, okay, in the mid-watch, two in the morning, it's real quiet, you're there. And, and all of a sudden you hear this long dash. And, and then you, the first thing he said was, well, maybe it's someone tuning up. <laughs> and, and then there'd be a second dash. And by the third one, he, you know, you know what it is, that the real bad news is going to follow. And he'd say, you know, the hair on the back of your neck went up because, you know, you know some, someone's in real trouble and they're sinking. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, um, so how many times did this ship actually save people? Um, I don't know. That might be in the logs that... Uh, that we kept okay. and that uh, we have right. so I, I don't know um, but uh, it uh, I mean this sailed as a Navy ship in World War II right. basically from the west coast to to uh, the Lilithi Atoll where it loaded ammunition and things um, and then did some humanitarian uh, delivery rice and grain to India and places after the war and then uh, after the war it went back into civilian ownership because it was a civilian it was built by the maritime administration but the navy uh, got 10 victory ships uh, uh -huh. and actually it was in commission during the war as the navy it was the USS Red Oak Victory. So it was for the Merchant Marine, was it? Well, during the Navy, the, during the war, the Navy operated it, uh -huh. and, but it was a merchant ship then. Uh -huh. I mean, they, they, but, but the other for Korea and Vietnam, it was uh, you know, Merchant Marine with civilian crews mm -hmm. um, operated uh -huh. by, uh, under contract. With mm -hmm. a, a, same name the whole company. time? Wow, we kept the same that. name. Yeah, I don't know if it kept the same call sign, but it... Uh, the same name. Kept the same name. We know that during World War II it had a Navy call sign, uh, November Yankee Charlie India. So that's why one of our ham um, club call signs is NY6CI, and why some of the other World War II ships you know, have their ham club calls are like that. Okay. Um, Go so, Navy. <laughs> so, uh, and so that, you know, obviously K6YDM is uh, then the hand version of the uh, call sign. But uh, certainly uh, in Vietnam era, in, uh, in 66 and 67, uh, it was you know, its current call sign. And this is, uh, the ship was refurbished in 67, so it got the radio telephone, it got the radar, and air conditioning. Which mm -hmm. Air conditioning? Well, there were talk that some of the maritime unions would said they wouldn't sail on it if it didn't have air conditioning. Um, so, this is a service that the Coast Guard does, which basically they ask, it's something like automated you know, merchant vessel or emergency reporting or something, but they ask ships, um, and back in the day it was you send a radiogram, a free radiogram to the Coast Guard, uh, giving your position at a certain time, your course and your speed. And the Coast Guard would put this in their database, and if they got a, uh, a distress call from some ship, they would based on its uh, coordinates, they would run what other ships were close uh, using the data. So, and, and once a year they put out an end of year um, thing, you know, like what we've done, which also lists all of the ships that checked in during the year. So what's interesting, I looked at this and I said, oh, and I started looking through it, and this was the middle of the Vietnam War. Right. There were a hundred and over a hundred and thirty victory ships sailing that were listed in here, mm -hmm. and we're one of them. The, yeah. the Lane Victory is one of them. The American Victory. So Lane. how many are left? Uh, three. Yeah, <clears throat> this is uh, yeah. So this is one. The um, 
the lane, uh, which is home ported in Long Beach, and the American victory in Tampa. Three victories that are now. The O'Brien is a different type, then it's a Liberty ship. It's oh, a, it's a pre war design. Okay, so um, uh, hopefully, you can at least peek into the uh, engine room. But the one of the differences is the, um, the Liberty ships were slower and had a triple expansion steam engine, so they were like 11 or 12 knots, and the victories. Uh, Sixth or this one has a 6,000 horsepower turbine, steam turbine, and um, 18, 17 or 18 knots oh. speed. Oh, okay. That's a nice cool. surprise. <laughs> Liberty ships are pre war, and Victory yes. ships are du uh, commissioned during and ap uh, after yeah, the start were, of World War II. They were built actually near the end of the war. Okay. And, um, I didn't know that. So, um, uh, but, but, and they were called the Victory class, and actually all of the Victory ship names include Victory in them. So this is the Red Oak Victory, and most of the Victory ships are named for places. And so the Red Oak here is Red Oak, Iowa, which if you look in the gift shop, there's a, a 1943 issue of Life magazine with an aerial view uh -huh. of Red Oak, Iowa. But it was named because there was, I think, a National Guard unit from Red Oak that was in Africa, and that little town had the highest percentage of casualties of anywhere, you know, because a lot what of them were wiped out. Yeah, yeah. right, so. Um, but anyway, so that's, you know, and there's the Berkeley victory and the Cornell victory and the uh, Hannibal victory and Sioux Falls, you know, just you know, all over. But it's it's mainly uh, mainly places. Most of the most of the uh, Liberty ships were named for a lot of them for for people. Of, uh, significant. Things. How many of the Liberty ships are left then? Uh, as far as we know, two. Two. Uh, there's the uh, Jeremiah Bryan, Bryan, which is San in San Francisco, and the John W. Brown, uh, not that John W. Brown. <laughs> But uh, a, a John W. Brown, and they're in Baltimore. Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And and they op they're they're a part of a group, and there's one more ship <clears throat> that's part of a group called the National Memorial Ships, <clears throat> which um, all of these ships were you know, active in various wars, and were actually in World War II, and then. Possible, possibly afterwards, um, and they were all in mothball fleets. And so, this ship is out of the mothball fleet. In it Venetia. Was, and right, because uh, we live in Venetia. Right, and so it beautiful was beautiful Venetia. Yeah, so beautiful. for an Historic. act of, it was an act of Congress. Uh, John Doug Miller Jr.'s uh -huh. uh, right. past. An act of Congress and a dollar, and and we get the ship. Wow. So, um, but of course, when you think of okay, a, the first dry dock visit was like you know seven hundred and fifty thousand yeah. dollars. So, which really has to happen like every five years or so. Right. So we're, we have we're on an extension, but um, so you know it's not a cheap. Uh, Cheap thing, no. but so so we're, all of the others were are owned by uh, you know, some group uh, you know, of uh, memorializing things. So there's the the three victories, the two liberties, and there's an LST, which is a seagoing landing craft. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah. So there's it was, that one was. It had to be, uh, it was loaned or assigned to the Greek Navy and they had it and uh, so, but anyway it was recalled and, and it was, uh, I think it sailed itself back and it runs up and down the Mississippi River. Um, so, and it, it occasionally, and, and they got their Navy call sign back. Wow. Uh, so, some haven't lately because maybe the guy who usually is the op radio op isn't there but kph would, would work them they'd call kph um, from you know wherever they were uh, new orleans 
or somewhere. Now, what group organization operates this ship? Is over? A- it's the Richmond Museum Association. Okay. Which is, uh, it's but it's it's an active part of the Rosie the Riveter National Historical. Okay. Just in a different location. <laughs> right. Yeah. It, it, the Rosie Park is interesting because there's so many other artifacts, and they don't own them, but the establishing. As I understand it, the establishing things for the Rosie Park was that you will work with local groups that have things, you know, like some Kaiser Hospital this and some right. that. Uh, and so we uh, you know, were, our, uh, were a definite part of the attraction for the Rosie Park, mm-hmm. and, uh, uh, but we're, not, we're owned by the Richmond Museum okay. of, of History. Interesting, so, yeah. So Rosie the Riveter, and then this, and then what else is owned by them? By whom? By the Richmond History. Oh, no, Rosie, the Richmond Museum has a museum building, which has artwork and and things. And they own this ship as well. But that's it. And the Rosie uh, is a, a historical park. Doesn't really own anything, right. but it, uh, it has some displays, and they work with people who have significant. Yeah, a lot things. of museums do that. They get lo- loans from uh, donator semi lenders, is it? Uh, <laughs> on loan from. On loan from, yes. <laughs> but the Richmond Museum has a big collection of old of Richmond oh, historic they, history things. Oh yeah, okay. yeah. Wow. It's, uh, it's a building yeah. down on yeah. yeah. Evan. I haven't heard of that but it's, one. Um, Where is it? Uh, well, uh, let's see. I'll have to look that up. But it's, I think, on Nevin Avenue, Nevin Avenue, or on Fourth Street. I'll just look it up on. But yeah, yeah, Richmond Museum okay. of History. Okay. So we're kind of, you know, there's that, and there's the, the ship, and that's mm-hmm. the, the big projects that the museum does. But they have shows and displays and, mm-hmm. and things that uh, of. Richmond history um, okay. over the years. Um, Do they have any radios? Um, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, they have a lot, some some old cars and occasional, you know, pictures, including uh, the the shipyard railway that uh, that ran out here, like, uh, from sort of like downtown Oakland out here, sort of along 580. Okay. Uh, to the shipyard uh, because you know, so many people had to come and go every day. Right. But, uh, and so you see some funny streets in Berkeley, like, you know, why does it do this? And that's where the railroad ran back during the <laughs> year too. Uh, so, um, other little trivia detail. Well, one trivia detail this is a crystal radio we see here. So, a little. Cat's whisker, and, mm-hmm. and at the time, the maritime rules required that you have okay. If you lost all power, everything, then you have something so you could at least listen. This is tunes medium frequencies. We can we can hear broadcast stations on it. And, uh, but it's uh, you know it was required by the laws back then. Amazing. And the other thing is this is the only well, when the ship was built was the only AC powered piece of equipment in in the radio room, and, and that was not the a receiver that would normally have come with this console. Right. It would have looked more like this and built by Mackie Radio. That's uh, a different why did, manufacturer. Why did they add AC instead of Well, AC? Uh, it's that this receiver was AC only. And the question is, why is this receiver here? Yeah. Uh, it was put on when the ship was built. It's on the ship's builder's list. Right. And one of the guesses is that the Navy wanted it, or maybe Marad wanted it, because it has extra shielding so that, you know, local oscillator and IF signals don't leak out to the antenna where they could be radiated and be picked up by an enemy ship. So that, in fact, the model number of that, which is SLR, means shipboard low radiation. So 
so during the war, it was not only, you know, you had the, this radio, and when you go up to the chart room, there's one on the counter there, which was the morale receiver. And so that was connected to uh, another dipole antenna, and its output fed uh, speakers in the mess area so that you could listen to. Wow. Uh, by, at that time, would have been Office of War Information pre uh, VOA or maybe BBC or, <clears throat> or some of the armed forces radio stations in the Pacific, you know, from around. And that was also a, a low radiation receiver. And um, I've seen notices in various places like no private radios in your stateroom because mm -hmm. private radios would not meet the, mm. the requirements yeah, of, of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So so when the ship was so when the ship was built there was like eight hundred watts of AC on board from a converter. And that was for this receiver, the depth sounder, uh, a couple other instruments uh, were AC only. Everything else was DC. Yeah. And well, how many how many volts did they operate uh, on? 120, 240. So oh, 124 one for uh, the low power stuff, and then the, a lot of the motors, big motors, uh, the deck winches, and things were 240. And so they had a DC generator on yes, board? Two, two DC generators. And did they use batteries uh, on that line, or is just. Uh, no, no, it was. Um, it's just there straight were, DC generator. The only batteries were for cranking the emergency diesel. There was a lower power uh -huh. diesel that would give some power for emergency lights and the radio room. And um, the batteries were, there was a battery room there which we have not restored yet. But it mm -hmm. had batteries for, like this receiver and this unit would normally have been operated by batteries. Uh, mm -hmm. Two sets of batteries, so you'd be charging one and using the other one. Wow. And then there was a big set, like truck starting batteries, uh, bulldozer batteries, that ran a second uh, motor generator to run this transmitter uh, from battery. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> the power sources are the 110 volts, and the, this switch selects either from the engine room <laughs> main switchboard or uh, the emergency switchboard in the diesel room, and um, then if that power was lost, then you have batteries to it. So you're pairing this, powering this now from DC? Yes. This is actually, the plate voltage is running from DC, however, I'm slightly cheating and the, the filaments and the light is from AC. Okay. But normally, you know, when you get the battery room stored, that would be operating from a 6 volt storage battery. And, and the ship's line. So are you running a DC generator on the ship right now? No, we're running a rectifier. So uh -huh. the ship's power is three phase, 480 volts. Uh -huh. It comes... <laughs> J.O.D. I guess they give him a call.
So what frequency was that on? Uh, 80 meters, 35, 45. Uh, 35, 45. Which I have CW. to have a crystal for it. Um, so, uh, so, um, let's see. So I, I guess that um, pretty much, you know, so he's going to be standing by on the uh, Ryan and, the, and put their antenna up and it's okay. Um, at some point we'll give you a tour of our antennas if you want to see it, but also you probably want to see the other amateur radio. So room. is there any chance... Uh, like Carol. she gets to operate? Sure. Okay. Uh, either from here or from the other... Um... She's, she does code. She okay. does code. Yeah. yeah. Unlike the rest of us. Uh, <laughs> uh, is the other ship uh, ready to respond? Because I've got people also that are going to try to go on. Um, Maybe. <laughs> yeah. The thing with the O'Brien is uh, the, the radio room does not have the handset that's actually in the radio operator's cabin, which is next door. Okay. But uh, if we call, um, then he'll hear it and we can go next okay. door. Okay. And, uh, or I can, uh, what's, what's I can call him on 500 KC and ask him to... What, what's the frequency going to be that Carol's going to do? It well, it would be, uh, I think, about 3545. That's, okay. that's, that's what, what I have a crystal yeah. set up for, and it's, okay. uh, cool. it's pretty... Uh, seems to be clear at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so I'm going to post. Well, um, maybe not. <laughs> oh. Oh, here um, we go. Can I say more inside here? Yeah. Yeah, um, I think, uh, yeah, if you get the, the ship has a, a Wi-Fi network, so if, uh, if, you, uh, if you can log in and get that, then um, good. But, uh, 3545, what did you say? Yes. I saw that little neon bulb up there flashing while you were transmitting. Yes. Well, and I notice it's not connected to anything. It's uh, just connected, so it's like currents going out in an electric field. It, it, uh, it go, glows even brighter on 500 kc because uh -huh. there's a much higher voltage. Uh -huh. and, uh, yeah. Because the antenna is a little shorter uh, electrically. Now, were you a Navy radio man yourself? No, never. I've been oh. shoreside broadcasting electronics, but okay. never, uh, never in the service. Was anybody here in the Navy? No. Nope. I was a Navy uh, medical officer. Yes. Great. Love being aboard a ship. <laughs> Thank you. You know an awful lot of stuff here. You did a good study on it. So. Well, you know, you kind of absorb it after a while. Um, but, uh, and you refurbished these. Yes. Yes. So, <laughs> so I mean, uh, we do have we have a spare console. Uh, wow. <laughs> which is in pieces in the hole, so we stripped it from of parts and had to actually use some parts from it because there were, you know, a lot of the parts are standard radio electronic parts, but there are some, uh, like a special transformer and, and in the auto alarm receiver, I thought, well, let's see, am I going to have to heat that up, you know, get all the tar out and put a new transformer in the right. in the case, but we have one. Uh, was, so, I don't know if you want to see under the, under the hood. Whoa, that's a transmitter. Yeah. So, um, this one comes down farther. Uh, this one, um, you have to move the typewriter uh, uh -huh. for it to come down the whole way. What final tubes do you have in there? Well, this is a weird type. This is uh, Federal Telegraph 123. <laughs> so, but it's like, kind of like an, um, some other uh, similar triode. We have a few, uh, a few spares and... Um, uh, when, we, when we use them all up, we're going to have to do a conversion. But uh, and what's the power output of this? Uh, uh, nominally 150 watts. Oh. So there, there's there's uh, 1100, 1200 volts on the on the plates. Okay. So hey, we're operating a low power from these ships. <laughs> they well, use the full gallons. <laughs> yeah, although uh, probably uh, the Navy would have a much uh, uh -huh. bigger dedicated radio. And then this is the HF. Oh, look at that. So these are 811s. Uh -huh. 
and the as the sort of the way they did things back in the day, both uh, the shore stations and the uh, uh, ship stuff. Uh, this is the master oscillator, and there's a set of crystals here. Oh, great, yeah. Uh, some of which I have, uh, were actually in there, left over from Vietnam service. So these are ones that you can take apart and actually mm -hmm. grind them. So uh -huh. I've ground some of these crystals for ham frequencies. But the way they designed this, the output of the VFO here in the crystal oscillator is between 2 and 4 megahertz. And then, uh, actually between 1 and 2 megahertz for, the, uh, for this, this radio. And everything gets multiplied up. So, you know, doubled and if necessary tripled. So, you know, there's a crystal here like at 1700 KC and that would be used, uh, that would be doubled and used on 80 meters, you know. And um, I got a couple of crystals that are the, the plated type. Uh, more stable for a couple of the um, calling commercial calling channels. Mm -hmm. uh, what's what's your call sign? Uh, WB6UZX. Thank you. Um, this radio is in two models. I mean, it's a standard Pi section output, mm -hmm. but this model has this extra capacitor and tapped inductors. And you can load anything on any frequency. <laughs> That's the, the great thing. I mean, you can load up the 35 uh, foot sloper uh, emergency antenna. Uh, you know, when you load that up, you can wow. load anything, which is really um, And obviously, they needed that for you know, different ships, different antennas, or if you had to put up an, an emergency antenna. Uh, Oh, sure, the military, they had uh, the f entire HF spectrum during the war. I mean, they weren't restricted to any uh, frequency, particularly. Right. <laughs> um, so, uh, oh, and, and again, the ship is basically DC. So you'll see a power outlet like that. Mm -hmm. And it has that childproof thing on it, which is not necessarily for children. <laughs> it's like, don't plug anything in that DC would blow up. Uh, I've used it for you know, soldering irons, straight irons, and lights, trouble lights, but it's DC. Uh, and most of the staterooms are, do not have any AC in them. Um, they've, they've been adding AC here and there. When the ship was refurbished in 66, it got an extra shortwave receiver, it got the radio telephone, and an AC outlet, uh, which gives a little more. So, uh, to run that, yeah, there's an AC out there, but that's from 66. Uh, but like the operator's stateroom, there's no AC in there. Uh, the lights, uh, there's outlets, you can plug a shaver into the outlet above the basin, but it's a DC outlet. Um, and uh, that was, that was the, the, the style back in the day. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That's great. So